Colorado's top law enforcement officer talks about abuse of the new red flag gun control law, a misconception about Denver's campaign against homeless camps. A senator dodges our impeachment questions, then gets stuck on a plane with our political reporter. The voice of the Rockies is out as mass layoffs hit the radio industry. And we revisit an age-old question from the stock show. Hundreds of animals doing their business in the city. Where does what they do go? That's next. Colorado's red flag gun seizure law has its limits. A judge tossed a case against a CSU police officer today, said that a mother could not use the new law to disarm the officer who killed her son a shooting that was ruled justified. Our Steve Steger asked what happens if the next person wrongly accused under red flag is not a police officer. Well, why do you think I've abused it? I mean, why are you asking me that question? Why a mother facing questions outside of a Larimer County courtroom after refusing to answer questions inside. I did not present my evidence or arguments in this case because the judge refused to recuse himself. Susan Holmes wanted a judge to take away a police officer's guns. Drop the knife, man. Corporal Philip Morris shot and killed her son Jeremy in 2017 when Jeremy is seen on this police body camera running at the officer with a knife. The shooting was ruled justified. In a petition to the court, Holmes said she had a child in common with Morris and wanted his weapons removed because he was a threat. The judge threw the case out after saying they were not related as required by the red flag law. I recognized it was a tragedy that a young man lost his life in 2017. However, um, a mother's grief only goes so far to place false allegations and try to drag a very high uh, reputable officer through this is absolutely inexcusable. Republican Larimer County Sheriff Justin Smith is one of a number of critics who worries this law makes it too easy to harass people, as is Leslie Hollywood, a gun rights advocate for Rally for Our Rights. She pointed out the officer had the luxury of being defended by the Colorado Attorney General. If this was me, would that be happening as well? I highly doubt it. That's a scary thought. This was a positive development that showed this law can't be abused for purposes of harassing an officer. This Democratic AG Phil Weiser said his office defended Morris because of the state's relationship with CSU. You don't want to do this, man. And he Drop says, the despite the critics right claiming this Drop law this. puts people at man. risk of harassment, Drop it is the working man. the way it should. I'm sorry the officer went through the difficulty that was part of this process, but the reality is this officer didn't lose access to a firearm. This officer is still on the job. The attorney general says that people who are harassed using the red flag law could look for compensation for attorney's fees or missed work. We reached out to Larimer County prosecutors. They won't say at this point if they're going to bring charges against Susan Holmes for misrepresenting her relationship with that officer. Denver continues its aggressive campaign against the homeless encampments in the city. I told you yesterday how Denver was using every legal tool, stuff well beyond the camping ban, which might not survive a court challenge. Today's cleanup at 21st and California was not done under the camping ban or the sidewalk homeless sweeps program or the health department order that was used to clear the park in front of the Capitol yesterday. This time, the city justified the cleanup saying that it was, quote, clearing items from a public right of way. Now, I'm guessing the most folks realize this, but the people who are homeless don't just leave town after the city clears the camps. They simply disperse to other areas in Denver. Advocates with Denver Homeless Out Loud say that we've been giving more attention to these sweeps, but they've been seeing them for years. I would hope that this would not need to be said on the issue, but the feedback that Next is receiving about Denver's homeless encampments suggests that this needs to be said. Being poor is not a crime. Being homeless is not a crime. A viewer named Sue suggested this, incarcerate the homeless for six months. They would get a bed, food, warmth, showers, counseling, education, drug rehab, learn a trade. Sue says this might be a less expensive and humanitarian alternative for the city. All right, so some of the goals of Sue lined, there, lined out there, those are worthy, except for, you know, that first part where the government would arrest people for being poor. But, 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 but drugs, you say? Years of studies show that locking people up for drug addiction is ineffective and it's expensive for taxpayers. Same goes for mental illness. 
Here's the deal. Denver's homeless encampments are the result of complex and difficult issues. We have to be aware of anybody who says they have a simple solution. Senators, including Colorado's Michael Bennett and Cory Gardner, signed an oath today promising impartial justice in President Trump's impeachment trial. Now, CBS News says that the White House is worried that Senator Gardner and a couple of other Republicans could defect and, and vote with Democrats to allow witnesses at the impeachment trial. That would be against the wishes of the White House and GOP leadership. We asked Senator Gardner's spokeswoman directly today whether he supported the idea of witnesses. And we got the same word for word canned statement that they've been giving to journalists questions lately. So let's play the canned statement reading music, please. Senator Gardner says, quote, I am focused entirely on fulfilling my constitutional duty as an impartial juror and my responsibility to listen to both sides present their case, end quote. Okay, so fun story. Right after we got that canned statement, our politics guy, Marshall Zellinger, is getting on a plane in Washington and, hey, look who that is back there. Small world, there's only so many flights. So, so, Senator Gardner declined an interview with Marshall, but you know how Marshall rolls, so he just started asking questions. And he asked Senator Gardner if he would vote to allow witnesses in the impeachment trial. Gardner laughed and said, we have a trial. I don't know, it was worth a shot, right? Most people watching this show could pick up a phone and video chat with me right now. Maybe we should do that in our feedback segment. But a segment of the population, mainly in rural Colorado, can't count on a good video chat connection. And that complicates plans to give them better access to doctors. Here's Nusha Roy. When the internet drops while you're watching Netflix or Hulu, it's annoying. When the internet drops when trying to video chat with a doctor, someone's life could be in danger. Somebody who's having a crisis, maybe contemplating suicide, that's not a time where you want that connection to go away. Professor Jeff Helton with MSU Denver said telemedicine is a popular idea to help people living in rural Colorado, where doctors and behavioral health specialists are too far away, except it's these same areas that don't always have strong enough internet to properly video chat. It's something that you know, here in the Long the Front Range, we take for granted. This is a map of the state. The areas in green have stronger bandwidth. The areas in orange, yellow, and red don't. The FCC identified 99,000 houses and businesses in rural Colorado that could benefit from better internet. And we'll be voting at the end of the month on whether to start a new program so people can apply for grants to get high-speed broadband. And when telemedicine does work... Participation of of um, male patient rises significantly. Mental Health Colorado also said it helps navigate stigma that can stop a person from getting the help they need. In a small community, people will recognize your, the make and model of your vehicle and to drive up in front of the behavioral health center and leave your car there for a couple of hours is something that people don't want to do. The idea has enough momentum. The state is looking to expand telehealth to some rural county jails by July. At the same time, new state laws are trying to keep pace with the internet access problem, including one that went into effect in August that's supposed to make it easier and cheaper to set up the infrastructure for more bandwidth. So there are also state incentives for companies to provide better internet, especially in those places in the state where there aren't a lot of people. So it wouldn't necessarily make financial sense for a company to do this on their own, which is why the state's offering up some money as well to maybe bring them out into those parts of rural Colorado. And so we've talked about this, Anusha, as a rural issue for a long mm -hmm. time. But I mean, what if I'm in the metro area and just the parking at my doctor's office is really bad. Yeah, there's a lot of hospitals that are starting to offer this kind of service for people within the city as well, because, you know, not everybody lives near a doctor. Maybe they don't have a car. Maybe mm -hmm. they have to take mm -hmm. a bunch of buses to get to the doctor as well. Not necessarily easy. But, you know, the one thing that I did hear all day today was this isn't necessarily a replacement for a doctor, but it is a good option if, if it's difficult to get to one. Sure. One more way to connect, exactly. I guess, if everybody wants to do it that way. All right. Thank you, Nusha. The woman from Parker, accused by police of plotting a child kidnapping with some right-wing conspiracy theorists, has not had her case sent back to Colorado, where, from Montana, where she was arrested. So Cynthia Absa came to court in Montana yesterday for an extradition hearing, but that was continued to next month. Parker police say that Absa was planning an armed raid with other QAnon believers to take her son back from the child welfare system. QAnon conspiracy theorists think that President Trump is fighting a secret war against satanic pedophiles in the Democratic Party, Hollywood, 
and in the child protective system. A judge in Colorado has blocked the public from seeing anything about that case here. The voice of the Rockies for a decade has been silenced for the time being. Jerry Schemmel has been laid off by 850 KOA's parent company, iHeartMedia. That company slashing jobs at radio stations across America. iHeart would not even give Schemmel's departure the dignity of a direct statement to us. They sent us this corporate speak about modernizing the company. Would not even mention Schemmel by name. Jerry Schemmel is going to be all right. He's a man of faith and talent and toughness. This is the guy who survived a terrible plane crash back in 1989. United Flight 232, which crashed in Iowa on the way to Denver. He made it out of the wreckage and he went back in to save a baby. 122 people did not survive that crash. Schimmel wasn't ready to sit down and talk today, but he told us that he was shocked and sad to lose his job. And he said that he's ready for the next venture God has in store. This is Clear Creek, which you will notice is not a clear creek. You wondered why and proof that the stock show is the best of old Denver. Old Denver. And my kids look at them and they go, oh, that's ancient. Also, nice hat. Next. Clear Creek is only as clear as what is coming downstream and something upstream from Huntsman Gulch last night turned the creek orange and brown. A photographer named Jim Langhofer sent us these photos and was curious what is happening in Clear Creek these days. So we took the photos to Jeffco Open Space and a guy named Matt Robbins. He knows a bit of something about weird colored water. He was working for the state in Durango at the time of the Gold King mine disaster. Remember that when the, when the river turned yellow? He thinks that what we're seeing in Clear Creek is from an ice dam break. It could be like a bunch of, of leaf litter and debris coming down. Robin says that if that had been uh, chemicals or oil or something from a mine, there would have been a big time response downstream in Golden. Huntsman's Gulch is just past Tunnel 1 as you're headed west in Clear Creek Canyon. <laughs> Cloudy, windy, and
and chilly in Denver today. We're tracking a storm headed our way from the west. Temperatures below the average of 44 and tomorrow we're going the other direction. We have a lot of moisture coming into the state from the southwest and that will translate to heavy snow in the southern mountains. Winter storm warnings posted for up to a foot of snow. For the front range, we stay dry and watch as the wind increases. The area in purple, high wind warning. West of I-25 over some of the higher passes could see gusts in excess of 70 miles per hour. High wind watch to the south of the metro area and advisories for snow in the northern and central mountains. About three to six inches of snow timed well for the upcoming weekend. And so tomorrow you'll either be impacted by snow or wind or blowing snow, but we do have a storm coming in in the morning, so just be aware when you make your plans. Tonight, not bad. Cloudy 25. The winds will be increasing toward dawn, especially along the foothills. Highs tomorrow warmer, low 50s. We have a dry weekend. Temperatures soar into the mid 50s Monday and Tuesday ahead of the next storm. And finally, Denver gets in on some of the action. We've got a chance for snow here in the city next Wednesday into Thursday. In the meantime, the clouds around the area sure do make for a pretty picture, such as this one in Crested Butte from Betty Cox. Thank you, Kathy. All right, let's play our favorite game here on next. What do you say? And tonight we're talking about the name of a little town in Weld County, which may be two words, could be one. And then there's the whole pronunciation issue to settle. We figured the town's mayor would be a good person to ask, what do you say? I've heard it called La Salle. I've, I've heard it being said that it was named after a particular explorer back in the day. Um, I think the most recent and most common, I think that most people are familiar with is um, that it was named after LaSalle Street in Chicago. And then there's always been the um, I don't know, question as to whether it's one word or two words. There were some to think that it's two words, but, but I think everybody here is in the consensus that it's only one word. I would have liked a little bit more confidence that answer from the mayor. I don't know about you. Okay, LaSalle is what we have. Legal documents have it as one word, like you see there on the screen, but you know, legal documents also have my name is Chester. Which pronunciation should be next on our list? Email suggestions to next at 9news.com or give us a shout with the hashtag HeyNext. A young curious reporter once learned that you can buy compost made from stock show manure. I wonder if that gotten old or whether you can still spread a little stock show in your garden. That's next.
The National Western Stock Show has been around since 1906, 114 years. I mean, you really want to freshen up the attractions and advertising at least every 50 years or so. And we see proof of that through the lens of photojournalist Corky Scholl. My name's Keith Fessenden, and I'm the historian archivist for the National Western Stock Show. So that was the last year before the rodeo. What I tried to do is gather as much of the history of the stock show as possible. As you can see, we have a lot of programs. The program provided a lot of information about the stock show, and they'd also have a lot of interesting advertising. I look at some of these now from the 50s and 60s, and they look a little dated, but I remember them being there. And my kids look at them, and they go, oh, that's ancient. So there's a lot of history here that's kind of fun. Well, this is 52, but that's the year they first used the Coliseum. You know, there's a lot of them that are kind of fun. The way it uh, portrays the horse show, I think, is reflective of the time frame. I would hope that people, when they looked at these old catalogs, would take away that Denver, while it's a modern, progressive city, has a wonderful Western heritage and past, and that the new National Western Grounds is going to continue that heritage into the future in a way that we can all enjoy even more. All right, so that was old school. I mean, way older than our Throwback Thursday, as we remember the 2009 stock show, when a young Nine News reporter asked, with all those animals in the city, where does the poop go? You go up the ramp and you got a bucket full and it's just steaming, it's kind of hard to see where you're at. <laughs> Todd Blake hauls four semi-trucks full of feces each day. I don't smell too righteous all the time. He takes it 25 miles north to a field in Weld County where it's dumped and spread into row after row of steaming piles. So some of you at this point have got to be thinking this is just a bad attempt to get a series of juvenile jokes on television and you don't think this is very funny at all. I think you're full of shavings and straw does go to composting. I thought I was pretty funny. Uh, back in 2009, we followed the stock show waste there. You know, so starts at the, the west end of a bull facing east, and then it goes to those fields up north where it's turned into compost. And back then it was taken to Permagreen Organics in Arvada, and they would bag up the compost. You could actually buy it, like at Home Depot. I called Permagreen today. They no longer have the contract. The stock show says there's another local company doing it. Boss Compost. They bring in trucks in the middle of the night. They truck out the manure. They take it to a, a ranch in Fort Lupton, and that's where it's converted into compost and they used it at job sites up and down the front range. You would like to talk a bit more about the homeless camps, and we'll do that next.
Doris writes to us tonight, I'm always shocked and saddened to see the lack of compassion from the public regarding the homeless. My son's been homeless. I'm grateful he crossed paths with the right organization. Maybe our city governments need more empathy and compassion. They might find ways to help the homeless rather than deal with them. 